focus on individual behaviors. So like if we focus on individual behaviors, forgetting the, the environment, the context, doesn't work. Now there is more and more focus on the importance of social norms and cultural norms in promoting the change we want. Um, brief historical evolution. Behavior change through all powerful media, it was what was conceived under the Second World War. And then we thought that knowledge information would actually uh, make behavior change possible. Didn't work that well. And then it evolved with vertical communication. FAO was a big, in the United Nations, was a big pioneer in this. And they, they tried to make extension more communication-wise, but not quite enough. DSC means Development Support Communication. That's what, how FAO called that. And then finally, in the, end, in the 80s, they start widening, widening this approach and saying we need also different media. We need multimedia approaches. We need um, television, radio. We need interpersonal communication. And that's where C4D approach became more interactive as well. In the 90s, it comes more strongly what can be called a new paradigm, which is participation and participatory communication with Robert Chambers. As I said, I, I, did, I work on this. I was very lucky to be in, uh, in Zimbabwe with a team of FAO doing probably what was at the time the only development, communication for development project in this way. And we push for development communication to be adopted by different ministries in several countries. It was Zimbabwe, Botswana, Zambia, Malawi, South Africa, Mozambique. And uh, I really learned a lot there. Then, after 2000, it came a big influence of social norms. Very interesting work also done by Professor Bicchieri at Pennsylvania University. Uh, and of course, they start to come what we are now, the importance of digital media, digital networks, uh, with all the pro and cons that these have. OK, this has been very quick highlight. And now it's about we are getting to the new model I want to present, um, which actually is not new. It's just a combination of the old one, repackage, and with a different focus. Uh, it comes from two main uh, approaches or methodology. One is this I was talking developed in Zimbabwe. It's called participatory rural communication appraisal, still being widely used in the world, especially by FAO and been taken by some academic center like the Philippines and Academia Los Baños. Um, it's a participatory communication which was scientifically uh, developed to engage and empower stakeholders from the assessment of the situation to the implementation of the grid change. It was rural because we were working in communities in the rural areas with people, with farmers which are usually not involved in decisions, okay? And it was, at the beginning it was very hard, it was very challenging because even farmers didn't think they had the knowledge to actually be heard. And again, I go back to what I said about Paulo Freire when he talks about empowerment and transformation. And we had to fight the stubbornness of many ministries, line workers which didn't think or even consider that somebody at the rural level could have the knowledge to, uh, that was relevant to implement changes. And I like to tell this, and probably some of my colleagues from India might remember, a very simple example, still, which is still in my mind because it was so, so incredible, a project in northern of Namibia in the, in the border with Angola, in Okavango region, where the extensionists of FAO told us that they, they develop a, a, a way to harvest and farm much better in um, drought-prone areas. And among the many things they had, they say that if you plant your crop 20 centimeters one by one, the seeds, you'll get much better crops, more harvest. And they told us, you know, we call you C4D people like blockbusters, go there and tell these ignorant farmers that they have to do this because they are still doing the broadcast, throw everywhere the seeds. So we went there and 
in line with participatory communication, what did we do? We didn't start by telling them what they should do. We just asked them, you know, you, you've been told that if you do this by row, you can have better harvest? And they said, yes. The second question was, so why don't you do it? And they told us, because we have a lot of rodents here, they're very smart, and they find the pattern very easily, and they eat 80% of our crops. If we brought seed, we save more than half. So all these big specialists from H quarters, none of them thought of asking them why they, they didn't do it. And you know, it's a very simplified example, but it gives you a good idea of the importance of involving stakeholders when you want to do a change or innovation. And of course, this talk about the second part, ownership. And then the other part for this multidimensional economic model is a socio-ecological model. I guess you're all familiar with that? Yeah. Okay, so uh, it means that you, any behavior is embedded in a cultural context and social context. And you cannot not consider it when you want to change. And that is a part that many too often, especially what used to be known as behavior change communication, didn't take into account and didn't go anywhere. Then, then when I left India, I became almost unwillingly a representative, which is a person that does not do much work except make sure that everybody else work, and then he gets a credit. <laughs> and at that point, I realized that there are other dimensions to consider when you want to do the change. And that is what I call the multidimensional approach and analysis. Because there are, I divided the work, and this has been applied by some of my of colleagues, and they told me that it makes sense. I divided four dimensions. Three are context related, meaning that you need these dimensions as to create a conducive environment for individual change. The first is called public policy, and it's basically concerned which policy are in place, and then we'll make a, a, an example. Are they aligned with SDGs? Which new ones would be need? Uh, are infrastructure and services adequate? And what budget do we have? All issues that are related in the policy arena, right? The second dimension is the institutional organizational ones. Are, these, are there state institutions with the mandate and capacities needed to promote the change we want? And, and that other civil society organizations or private organizations that can support and tend the change. And if there are none, or if there are but don't have enough uh, knowledge and competencies, how can we help them build that? And the social cultural dimension, which we talk, about which norms are there to impede it uh, or to support the change, which expectations need to be changed in order for individuals to take the change, and which media networks and other influential sources are relevant for that specific change. I guess this presentation will be then made, shared with everybody. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, and then here we come, we actually is the individual behavior change expected. What are the perception, knowledge, attitudes? And here you have all the, I mean, I'm sure all of you are familiar, all the approaches you have in behavior change, behavioral insights, but you can do no matter what the biggest, greatest, more fantastic behavioral insight there, but if the rest is not aligned, it's very difficult to, um, to actually promote the change and make it sustainable. And I'm, I'm telling you something that not many people knows, because in my article I'm not saying where all this originated from, but it originated from a work in India when we start working and a couple of guys here knows. Uh, we're trying to stop urinating in public, okay? Uh, because there was quite a bit of that. And if you go here and say people should do to stop doing that because it's bad health and everything we want. Yes, but, and I'm not the number change, but at the time, 600 million people did not have access to bathrooms, 600 million. So no matter how you want to tell them, please don't do it in the streets, 
They cannot blow off because they cannot do it. They need, you, know, you need that. And to do that, you need policy, for instance. Uh, at the time, it was not mandatory for all restaurants to have toilets. I don't know if now change. And that you can work. Infrastructure. Some of the schools in rural areas, they didn't even have division for male and female bathrooms. And they didn't have enough for all the children in school. So you need to do that. Institutional. You work at the, at the uh, ministries, rural development, education, and start to see, do they have the mandate to, to make the, the environment where then individual change can happen? Social and cultural norms. I still remember, but I don't remember where. There was one place in one region where they didn't want to build latrines by the house because they said that the bad odor would scare the spirit away or something. So in that case, you need to change the norms if not, no matter how much, the individual behavior will not happen, okay? So this is a bit, as I said, coming up from the many mistakes done in the past, how I, I developed this model. Because, and what the question that was asked today also, where do we start? You don't start from one place in particular. You need to do an analysis, a diagnostic, see where you are on this. You don't need to have 100% everything in place, but you need to have more of this in place. You need, to, you need to make sure that you have the policies are covering the aspects you want to change, um, but it's not enough. I'll tell you an example of my country, Italy, even though I haven't been living there 30 years, when they had a law to make people putting seat belts while driving, they did a big law and they spend a lot of money also in policing the, the first period making tickets. Okay, when they stopped policing, because it was a temporary thing, most people put the seat belts in the north of Italy, which is very different than the south of Italy. In the south of Italy, after the first few months, less than half the people put seat belts on, because the cultural part is very different. So you need to consider all this when you do your changes. And, uh, and now, I would go back to what we said in the beginning. By the way, I would like to hear you afterwards on this. What do you think, where do you think we should do the priority here? Any ideas? Yes, please. Uh, one, two, nine. The first one, the second one, and maybe the ninth one. The first one, the second one? Okay, and we see first one, second one, and the ninth. Okay. You see, the, anybody else would like to say something? Yes, please. Um, I think the first one is the fourth one. First one, second one, and fourth one. Okay, and so I see another hand somewhere. Yes, please. For me, we have to focus on the problem, but we have two different approaches. Thank you. Yeah, and you are, you are right, and you're not right, because <laughs> you, well, what you say they are very important, but in the same way as what I said before, they are not enough to be addressing the issue and to provoke the change you want, unless you tackle all the rest as well. And some are overlapping. So let's see, number one, student motivation is low, as they do not see high value education. This goes in the social, cultural, and individual one, okay? But, but, it also goes in the number five, for instance, Families provide little emotional support to the children for continuing their studies, you know, which again is social. Because there's also some economic reasons. Why? Because, and we go number two, families prefer to have their children to go to work after a certain age. They need money, especially we're talking about poorer families. And it's not a surprise that the dropout rates are disproportionately higher in the bottom quintile of the populations. Okay. Uh, the school curriculum is not adequate to current challenges. 
In this institutional, the Minister of Education should take care and provide change to make the curriculum um, more current or relevant, if you want, to current challenges. But this again is public policy because there are things that cannot be done simply by the Minister of Education. For instance, if I would become, and I don't think I will ever, but the president of a country like Chile, I would put in the curriculum also a subject on peace or non-violence, the importance of having conflict resolutions, especially in this world which is becoming more and more polarized, which seems now we, don't, we are not capable of discussing without getting into a fight. You know? um, I think that should be addressed at school. Climate change is something that some countries are starting to put, but most countries do not have climate change issues in the curriculum. And I think it's something we want to consider, going back to the discussion of this morning. <laughs> Number four, teacher teaching method and skill, not good and not effective, institutional. I mean, I don't know Ethiopia, I don't know here if you have the same issue, but in many countries, in Latin America especially, teaching is down totally vertically. I'm the teacher, you listen, you learn. Uh, and this is not a model that is sustainable anymore. Of course, the teacher is the one who in a way has more knowledge, but you know, I read in a, in a very interesting article that we are probably, I am part of the first generation where their sons and daughters know more than us in certain things. I mean, my daughter is now 17. Whenever I have a problem with my cell phone, she, I mean, she don't, you don't know, she, she does something and she gets everything from social media to selfie. Every time I do a selfie, I get constantly criticized. <laughs> I never criticized my father or mother ever when I was a kid or anything. But it's, it's much more dynamic. And students, again, the climate change, the climate change, the, the protest against certain things in climate change is led by adolescents. And so, you know, we need to give voice, we need to have a different way of approaching education. Uh, I told about the families provide little emotional support, also because in a country which is highly, is working now anyway, uh, in, a, in a, no, I don't know if it's a battery or something. In a, in a country which is, is uh, yes, which is highly, with a high inequality, um, families do not see any hope in the future. I say, why should I send my sons or daughter to school to finish school when nothing will change in his or her life? So when she's 16, 15, she goes to work, she helps the family, and, and, and that's it. And, uh, and that's, again, it's something that needs to be considered when we want to try to stop or reverse these high dropout rates. Health-related issues, especially after COVID, is a matter of public policy, institutional. Um, oh, by the way, this one, number two, I put there the um, public policy dimension because, for instance, we are, we are doing some cash transfer to more vulnerable families, which helps education. Now there is a big discussion if cash transfer should, should be conditional or not conditional. You know, I think the, when I was at the World Bank, World Bank liked to do it conditionally, meaning that if your kids finish one year of school, you get this, and then next year you, you get again. Is it me? Okay, I, I'll talk, can I talk without this? Yeah? Okay, so um, then, se number seven, several schools are in old and not suitable buildings. Infrastructure is old, creepy, falling down, not enough. And of course, that's a matter of public policy. They need to provide more budget to build new schools or to renovate them and make sure that if children go back to school, they have where to go. The authoritarian approach by teachers is linked to the teacher training method and skills. And is again, very much an institutional dimension I don't know what it is. Oh. Okay. This is called noise in communication terms. Uh, 
And then the school and associated bullying and violence with, uh, I don't know where. Okay, um, and uh, so, so schools associated bullying and violence, uh, which is very much related also to e-bullying, internet, which is something more on the social and cultural uh, part, and individuals. So um, with this, I would have finished because I would like to listen to your comments, reflections. I mean, I try to, to keep it in a nutshell um, it's, it's much there is much more uh, but I'm willing to, to you know I'm very interested to know your feedback on this if you have questions reflection if you think it can work also here or not and why not or why yes thank you I feel like Michael Jackson with his mics and stuff okay uh, any anybody and not just questions, also comments, what do you think? Be, be honest. Uh, uh, thank you, Norman from uh, uh, DRC. Okay. The, if we just consider this particular example, the, there's definitely a lot that needs to be done and at different levels requiring different amounts of investment. So as SBC practitioners who uh, looking at having you know some impact in the next I don't know six months, one year or something like that. For example, building schools that doesn't take a short period of time. I think even they ask you this in the morning, you know, where exactly should we start from or what should we be focusing on at this point in time, like for this particular example, to have some bit of impact as the other institutions or other aspects try to catch up. Uh, you know, with the work that, you, that has already been done. And this is just school, but you can as well relate it to yeah. vaccination, which is a very big issue, especially after COVID. Uh, there's a lot of hesitancy because of everything that was said about the COVID vaccine that has affected polio, measles, and the cases are now going up. It, should we wait for the policies to first catch up, or should we wait for more vaccines to be purchased, or there's something that we can do within SBC as we affect other program implementation, at least have some some bit of positive change in, in, in those communities, especially the most vulnerable uh, in, 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 in the different countries. Okay, thank you. No, and uh, that's a very good question. You know, in the States, they, they tell you to say every time, that's a very good question. But this indeed is a very good question. Um, because it's, uh, I'll tell you an example. One of my biggest success that then was demonstrated was one of the biggest failure. Um, it goes back to the time of Zimbabwe, when we created the, what we call the Action Program for Communication Skills Development. It was a course of 10 weeks, three weeks, and they were, we would take in participants from different countries of Southern Africa. Each team of participants was considered by staff of the project, for a particular project, staff of the project, staff of the ministry related, could be health, uh, uh, rural, agriculture, water, and whatever. And we were a team of six facilitators. Each of us would follow one team. Three weeks of teaching the, the PRCA, how to investigate in a participatory way. Four weeks on the project side. We were living with the community, staying there, do the research, mapping, everything, and have been to some incredible places. And then three weeks to go back and design what we, was called the participatory design to improve the project. Uh, in 10 weeks, we did some fantastic work. We came back with some um, very strong and, and revised um, inputs and design of the projects, okay? That was a great success. Okay, next step is where you see that it was a failure. Because when the team was reported to go back, talk to the project manager or the ministry and tell this was done wrong, we need to change this, and maybe we need some more money for this. 
is where we got totally stuck. And then when we realized that we should have put in the training the decision makers, because we made people from the project, the ministry, switch and see the importance of involving communities, but the people on top didn't see it. And so we failed. And that's why what I say, yes, I know it's more complicated, but if you want really change to be sustainable, you need to involve the different dimension. And you need, in many cases, not always, but in many cases, you need to address policy makers. You need to, quote unquote, educate them to change. Now, with, with the immunization vaccination, it's a bit more complicated because of the, you know, the fake news and this fear that by some that vaccination is actually inoculating, I don't know, there were some points, some chips to control us and whatever, the blood. That re requires a very dif di different approach. But you also have to see how much or how strong is this resistance. No? And you know that in classic communication, when you do a mapping, you have, for a change, you have the neutral ones, you have the one moderately against, moderately in favor, and then you have the one very much in favor no matter what, and very much against no matter what. And we know communication-wise, forget about no matter what and totally in favor. Focus on the middle and the one which are reinforce the one moderately in favor and try to, to involve and convince the one which are moderately against. Um, there is no magic bullet receipt, so that's what we learn in 40 years of, of this. And again, any behavior and social change requires some kind of communication. And remember, if somebody can prove me wrong, you got a dinner free paid by me. <laughs> yes. Then, then, then. One, two, three. Thank you. My name is Grace. I'm a professor in So I have two reflections. One, based on this, and another one unrelated, but based on the question that you asked. Um, and I'll start with that one. Um, I think there is a social and behavior change intervention that doesn't necessarily need communication in the strict sense of the term. And um, this is particularly on nudges um, in the context of shopping behavior. So for example, if I'm trying to get people to eat healthy, mm -hmm. um, what I know about shopping behavior is that people always pick um, products that are within eye level, right? Because it's easy to see, it's faster to just pick, pick and go, pay and And so if I want to get people to eat healthy or pick healthier options, I just change the order in how I present healthy foods in a supermarket, such that I make all the healthy foods that I level, and so people will be more drawn to, to pick that up and, and go pay. So that's more of choice architecture and less about communication in the street sense. Okay, we're out there. Mm. Um, mm. Then the second point, um, also in response to his question, um, well, I agree that being able to target different stakeholders um, for you to be able to um, achieve effective change, I think there's also the importance of uh, behavior prioritization. Because um, yes, I might want to effect uh, policy change immediately and have it enforced, but can I pick the most pressing issues out of, for example, this list of mine? Um, and then build up with that. So for example, if I start at the lowest level, so student motivation, you know, changing teacher's perception, um, if I focus on changing that, and even getting families involved um, in, you know, um, in the education of their children, then I'm able to build, build case studies that I can take to policy makers to show them that this actually works, and here's an example it has worked in our context, and so there's more appetite at the policy level to effect this change. Because the challenge we've seen even in Kenya is that policies are affected, but then enforceability is very low because people are not willing to adopt those behavior. So can I take a bottom-up approach by picking the most pressing challenges, creating um, use cases of you know impactful change, and then skip the back? Thanks. Yeah, and oh, I start from the second. Uh, you can prioritize and start with something, but there are some that you can't. For instance, you, if one of the main reasons is that family don't like to send the, skills, the, the kids to school, 
because they need financial help. No matter what you do, otherwise that one will not go. Others, you can start targets. I, is, I would argue it's still communication, implicit, not explicit, you're right. But because you actually want to communicate to the person that this is what you need to buy and to put it right in the shell, high level. Exactly. One, two, and there is, I don't know if anybody read an article on The Economist about the shaky uh, evidence of behavioral insights. Uh, because it's increasingly said, yeah, for some things it's working, but for many it doesn't. And there is an ethical issue there. I mean, because that is exactly the opposite of what I've been discussing, the participatory part. Because you are trying to subliminal, subliminally influence people to do something. And I think that's ethically wrong. Not only in terms of development and being capable and empowering people to make decisions about their life, but even as a consumer. I, don't, I mean, I'm very bad because when I go to a supermarket, I'm one of the, of the victims of nuggets. I go, I buy a lot of crap. Every time I go up with half of the thing, I don't need. I just like them <laughs> and stuff. And, and I think it's, you know, it's, a, it's an issue of ethical behavior. And when we talk, especially in development, I repeat, you might use it in certain cases, but you have to be careful because it's not just convincing people to do something you want. It's making them see that the change might bring some benefit to them. But thanks. Rachna, and then... Uh, That uh, one of the reasons, and this is not about you know, uh, you know, defending anything, but my thinking, right, as not as user, but just as somebody in the SBC field, is that when we attach the second C, uh, the problem with something which is in your face, SBCC, SBCC, is that it becomes reduced to change happens because of the C, and C equals poster, flip book media, sports, something, maybe an application to today's age, right? And that became a huge uh, problem for the SBC community who understood that everything else has to be taken into cognizance also. Uh, so from that angle, I feel like it's good that C is removed and C becomes one of the approaches for SBC. Anyways, that's how I have convinced myself in my head. I want to talk a little bit on the you know, the, some of the social movements which have emerged. Uh, like, you know, this whole thing about uh, stopping tree cutting, uh, which happened two decades ago in India. Uh, this whole thing, the rage against a Khasi rape case which happened in India 10 years ago, uh, because of which thousands of young and youth came out on the streets. Uh, yes. They were communicated, but they were communicated, it was instant communication which was, which traveled through the uh, media, but they came because they felt repulsed, they felt concerned in the case of tree, they felt repulsed in the case of the brain case, and they were all out there agitating, resulting in a policy change. So of your three, uh, a fund was created in the name of the girl faced uh, the rape. So in that case, communication is an aid. Of course, nothing happens without communication. You know, you're brilliant there. But sometimes things happen because of the agency of people, because the issue is violating something which is inherent uh, inherent in our value system. So I just want to reflect that. Yes. Yeah. No, okay, two things. On, on, the, on the sea of communication, I think this field has progressed up to now because of communication. I mean, when we had communication for development in the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, nobody else was doing social and behavior change, basically. So that's why I think it's a mistake to remove the C, because you remove a bit the past you were in. But totally agree, the C by itself is not. And the C of communication sometimes can be your worst enemy, because it's too often associated with information and communicating things. And that's not enough. But if you go back and, and take communication, by the way, it comes from a Latin word which means communion, community, it's the same root. If you take it as Paulo Freire intended it, to share, 
with other human beings, it's a very different story, and that change comes much easier. And the example of that you brought, yes, but still the, the I mean, the violence against women is there in India. In countries which are supposed to be, I don't want to say more advanced, but whatever you want to call them, I've been in Uruguay and Chile, Italy, the feminicide is on the rise. You, you, you cannot imagine how much, how many acts of violence against women, usually done by their partner or former partners, because it's very difficult to change a culture completely. So you, you go incrementally, and yet sometimes you have backlash. One change that has been sustained in some countries is that of corporal punishment. When I was a kid, my father used to beat me quite hard, me and my brother. Now, and, and it was normal, you could see in the, in the street, in the school, my teacher in the elementary, she had a, I don't know you call it, a stick to measure. And when we did something bad, we had to put the hands like this, and she would give us two or three of these. Now that's unheard of, okay, in, in, some, in a number of countries. So change happens incrementally, and then when you get the, when you reach a tipping point, to say, then it goes much faster. But yet, there might always be pocket of resistance here and there. But yes, thank you, Sarah. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, just a few comments. The first one is, uh, I do agree that multi-dimensional analysis are very important for uh, behavioral change to address uh, any of uh, developmental issues. Uh, equal to that, uh, I think we need also to know uh, how much each of the, the, the predictors, this institutional, policy, social, cultural, and individual factors are influencing the, de the dependent environment within the research language. I mean, the dropout, for instance, in this case. So if we know in our analysis how much the, the individual factors or the social cultural is uh, predicting the, the, the uh, dropout, then our investment will be wiser enough to, to make those changes because we are always uh, have a resource shortage. <coughs> the second point I want to make is regarding the communication, uh, change without communication. Yes, we do need, I do agree that change is incremental and we need co to, to communicate, uh, but uh, communicate on the variables that highly predict this, the, 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 the issue that we are addressing. But also there are cases in which we may not need communication at all. For instance, in this country we have been conducting health extension program for several years, and we have been using our own uh, model families, model households. Model ho in model households, people see the model households, the model families, and get changed without having a communication. And how do they see them? Sorry. Uh, uh, for instance, uh, let me link this with, with your psychology. Albert Bandra, one of uh, psychologists, mm -hmm. says the best learning is an imitation. Families and the households look at those model households, and when they see that they are educating their children or they are they are um, having some practicing some health practice. Some but that's something. a communication. When they see them, you are communicating to them. <laughs> you can you cannot show them a communication uh, uh, because you cannot just tel use telepathy or something. You have, no. Sure. In that in that sense. It, yes. It, it, <laughs> but we don't say that the communication is a two-way system. Uh, giving uh, information, receiving an information, uh, two-way communication may not be engaged. For instance, improve, improving service by itself can change the behavior of an individual. If uh, a mother experiences negative experience at health services, and she will not go there. But because services are good uh, as, as, as one uh, variable, if a service is good, she, she can say that I can simply get service there, or it's good if I can. She can determine. In this case, improving the service may not require uh, communication because it's, it's, it's com communicating with the mother. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're, you're saying yourself, I don't have to say anything. Uh, no, it, it's okay. I mean, again, I'm not saying communication is only two ways. I'm saying to empower and to have sustainable change, you need two ways communication. But informing is it's a way of communication, limited. But, you know, what you say, your point is basically reinforcing mine. You need communication no matter what. I mean, then, when I decide to stop 
drinking Coca-Cola. The doctor didn't do communication in the classic sense, he thought, but he communicated to me I was in a risk zone and I decided to change. And again, tell me one example where there is no communication for a behavior change. Even building a bridge, when you decide to build a bridge, imply some changes, you need to tell people and communicate. Yes, there are those, you, you two, one in a row. Okay, no, that, that, that's a good point. I like that. I think probably here you can put institution as well, but how you categorize is relatively simple because you can ask yourself who is responsible, who, who can change that? For instance, school curriculum, not adequate. Who can change the school curriculum? The Ministry of Health, uh, Ministry of Education, so institutional. But maybe if it's too big of a change, you need to go with the policy, the parliament need to approve. In Chile, we have sexual reproduction. It's, it's a no-no taboo. Some people want, some people don't. That cannot be just the ministry of the school. It can go up. But you agree, some areas are migrate. I, I agree that you're right. School associated bullying balance. There is also a component of institution. Who is responsible? Norms, individual, but the school can help in addressing that. So um, in that sense, yes, you're right. Uh, and then you and then you, I don't know how much time we have. Yeah, thank you very much. Okay, so the last one I'll take together. One, two, and, and three. You had one? Okay, one, two, three. Okay. And then. Thank you for the presentation. So, my question is about how do we maintain the behavior of sustainability? Usually, like after social behavior change intervention, we observe the change that we want. But like sustaining is a challenge for us. So do we start from like scratch or is there any approach that we could come in for us and from your experience? Like for example, for what we think they already and then after a while the committees become same like uh, so do you have any recommendation for us? Any approach that you uh, recommend for us from your experience? Uh, you Thank you so much. Uh, I think that the communication issue is a continuous discussion that's going on uh, among scholars. These are people uh, take out C or you know, what they need. And there are some scholars who also 
that are suggesting that we should say uh, social behavior change intervention uh, rather than yes. Social behavior change what, sorry? Intervention. Intervention. Yeah. So it's a continuous discussion. It's still continuing uh, with this uh, discussion. But my question is, uh, I like the multidimensional analysis, but those multiple dimensions that are affecting uh, the behaviors that we matter to have, still, I do believe that it came out from the social ecological framework. Because uh, we look at the individual level barriers, community and family level barriers, especially these social cultural issues are you know, uh, embedded in, in, under, under the family and community who are practicing that law and also the organizational and the policy level. So, uh, do you really see differently this multidimensional analysis approach uh, we, you know, uh, from, from uh, the socio-ecological framework? Okay, uh, I'll, I'll reply to you. Uh, the last? Okay, thank you. Um, my question is also uh, similar with the one raised by another speaker. Uh, I just want to take the takeaway from uh, this uh, presentation. This theory, uh, you, know, you know, from uh, my understanding in health psychology, my background is promotion from health psychology, I know more than 83 theories. Those theories that are developed to influence certain behavior. So this, this um, multidimensional model is going to be additional theory or an additional model. So I just want to know what is the difference from socio-ecologic model. So the organizations are different. In socio-ecologic model, it's organized from the individual level to the policy level. But in this case, it's also organized as individual, socio-cultural, and uh, that policy. Yeah. Okay, so, so what would be the, the difference except uh, adding the participatory approach? And the other thing is scholars are working to to make those theories. You know, there's a challenge into the, on what what theory should be the best theory to, to influence a certain behavior. So scholars are working to um, have some sort of an approach to choose which theory would be the best fit for a certain behavior. From what I know, there's a theory called behavior change. Sorry. Um, behavior change wave theory, which says that for a certain behavior to happen, there should be a capability, there should be an opportunity, and there should be a motivation. So, this is the. the, the and they are trying to develop an ontology to, uh, to make the intervention that are implemented in a certain place to be replicable in another place. So is there uh, an extension of this theory? This is uh, already about how to diagnose a certain behavior, how to diagnose the problem. So is there an extension of what is the possible interventions in each stage? OK, thank you. Well, uh, OK, that would be it. But you said yourself, uh, what's the difference except participa participation? That is the main difference, participation. The socio-ecological model, first of all, never have any mentioning of participation, first. Second, I, I said from the beginning, these are the roots. It comes from the socio-ecological model, in part, but it's, an, it's a categorization of, of a more actionable point of view. There are three dimensions only, and these three dimensions include parts like the budget, national budget was not in the socio-ecological model, for example. And uh, the, I mean, the fact is this was a theory a bit to understand certain behavior. We said behaviors uh, actionable at certain levels. You know that in 1991, there is a book by Bella Modi, which is one of Indian, by the way, uh, of Communication for Development, which talk about the appropriateness of messages. And if you go there, there are five characteristics. They are very similar to what now are called SBC, uh, I don't know, principle or so, for easiness, uh, commodity, understandability, whatever, I don't remember. But the, thing, the problem I have with SBC now is that some try to make it 
appear like it's something new. It's not. It's been there with communication for development for 40 years, ev evolving. That's why the sea of communication is important. But please look, my model doesn't have the wall communication in it. Because communication is inside in different ways. When you go to public policy, huh? when you go to this, in public policy you need advocacy communication. You need to reach policy makers and you do it in a very different way. Not much of participatory communication there. When you go institutional you use a number of things, but you use strengthening, training, and that's all part of communication. When you do social cultural, you need how to change norms and how to change expectations. So that's a big difference. And then when you reach here, and then you can have fun with your nuggets, SBC, whatever. But the base of all this is participatory communication, is participation. If you want to achieve sustainable change, there is no other ways. Because as you said, you know, uh, sustainability. Sustainability is not easy. I don't have any tip like that. But I can tell you that all the examples I've seen in my life of change that have been made sustainable is because whoever did the change on the change felt it was their own change and kept it. When it was sort of pushed upon, the change only lasted until it was either in force or, uh, or they saw a temporary benefit for that and then they would go back to what they used to do before. So, to cut a long story short, this model, it's, that's why I said it's not new, it's an adaptation of two things, and that makes it new. And most of innovations are not new, they're always built on something previous. So the multidimensional model for change builds on the SEM, making it in three categories which are much, much more easier for you as development practitioners, both to assess, plan, and implement. Because you, you then divide, I need some actions which need to go here. You know, I think it was Sid who talked about segmentation. I need to segment and reach po policy makers. How and for what? I need to reach communication in Ministry of Education or rural schools, whatever. How and what kind of communication? And they need to change certain norms, certain behaviors, which are supported by the, by the communities. Female genital mutilation, is, it falls definitely there. And then you go to the individual one. Okay, so I'm sorry, I have no, I'm not behavioral inside that have nuggets that can change behavior. I don't think behavior sustain, in a sustainable way can change by nuggets. I think nuggets can help change you something or to buy something on the, on the shelf, but to change something in a more sustainable way, you need to involve stakeholders, you need to push participation, you need them, for them to own and to believe that the change is gonna make their life for better. Thank you very much. You. And if anybody wants to ask me something afterwards, I'm coffee or lunch or whatever. Thank you so much, Paolo, for sharing us all your uh, wisdom uh, with some of the, our audiences. And there is a, a popular saying that this uh, closes the debate of uh, what communication is. There is a saying, we cannot not communicate, yes? mm -hmm. which violates yeah, gram grammatical yeah. issues. Yes? Mm -hmm. So we cannot not communicate at all. You cannot avoid communication even if you want to avoid it, you can't. Okay? So thank you so much. And there is an announcement before the next session. Uh, so uh, during break, uh, the next break sessions, there will be poster presentations and everybody should visit the posters. And those of you who have a poster presentation, please stand by your posters and uh, explain to the audiences, okay, with the next uh, breaks. So, uh, yeah, can, the next I, session. can I ask something? Because yesterday yeah. we had some confusion with the lunch. With the, the, lunch. With, oh, with oh. the uh, who's gonna oh, give oh, the, yeah. 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 Thank you, yeah, I'm yeah, gonna yeah. have lunch today, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Behavior change. <laughs>
Yeah. But do they all have? Do they know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Huh? Oh, sorry. Yes. I, I don't want to take it from who you miss. Another presentation. Who? Who? Another presentation. I don't know. We will have good presentation. Most of the uh, community engagement and community level SBC implementation uh, are implemented by health extension workers. So it's like uh, one decade. So it's passed through different stages. So we will have uh, presentation on the best experience, challenges, and what's the best we, we learn it from that, and how to integrate our SBC program over there, uh, and how to improve even the community engagement, and how to integrate is also one point. So uh, my name is Sagadu. I worked as a SBC specialist at USID Community Nutrition Program on the Lehman side. Uh, my colleague uh, is uh, like my president. My pres uh, our presenter will be uh, Dr. Gzarchot uh, Abdala Zruna. Uh, he's uh, director of monitoring evaluation and research at GSI Research and uh, Training Institute. Uh, he's Honorable as Assistant Professor at Addis Ababa Continental Institute of Public Health. In, in uh, his background, uh, Dr. Gzarcho has a BSc degree in public health uh, and a PhD degree from Addis Ababa University as well as PhD degree uh, in public health from Gondar University. In, in his experience, he has extensive work experience, like more than 90 years. He has worked at, uh, at public health program designing, implementation, monitoring, and evaluation research for generating strategic evidence to facilitate public health monitoring and uh, programming over the year. He has developed uh, expertise on designing uh, and uh, data science method. So I think we, we will have further, uh, uh, now, uh, now further uh, knowing him with his saying. So it's welcome to Dr. Gzacho. Thank you so much, Dr. for your kind introduction. Uh, shall I put it here? Uh, the, the thank you so much. I will be very brief uh, since this is a large time. Uh, I have not been uh, engaged in multiple uh, presentations and uh, conversations etc. So I will be uh, presenting our experience on uh, uh, implementing uh, optimized health decision program. Uh, so specifically I will be discussing on two strategies, uh, the National Committee uh, Program Unit and also the merging uh, health posters uh, into the, the nearby health center and hospital. Uh, It's a health issue program uh, since its inception in 2003 has been contributing a lot in uh, improving access to uh, uh, health programs for the rural community. Uh, however, recently it, it has showed a decline in, uh, in, in, in its performance. As a result, the Minister of Health uh, has uh, studied this health issue program well and uh, developed uh, a roadmap to optimize this health uh, program to further extend uh, the, the reach for the rural, the rural community. 
so this roadmap has uh, strategic uh, ob objectives, some of which are uh, which include like restructuring there to be integrated into uh, the health center or the primary hospital, uh, and also establishing uh, a, a community health program unit under the health center and hospital is one key strategic objective uh, highlighted in the uh, national uh, HIP roadmap to optimize the health program. And the other is, is also upgrading those uh, health posts uh, which are very far uh, from the catchment health center or primary hospital uh, into compressive uh, health posts to provide compressive uh, RMC services including outpatient uh, care and, and other compressive uh, primary care. Uh, and the other is also those uh, who are in the, the middle to optimize uh, that health post uh, and also uh, they make it in, into basic uh, health post to provide basic primary care. Uh, so, so one of the, the major undertaking was that categorizing these health posts into compressive ones, basic and also integrated or merged into uh, the health center or primary hospital. Uh, the other intervention is also uh, deploying new health cadres into these uh, health posts, particularly into compressive ones and basic ones. These compressive ones will be uh, staffed with additional midwives, nurses, and health officers to provide these compressive uh, services, uh, and also strengthening the community health, uh, the community engagement strategies. It's also uh, the other key strategy. The strategic objectives that's highlighted in the HIP roadmap. Uh, since March 2020, the uh, AMREF Hills Africa and GSI in collaboration has been implementing uh, improving primary care service delivery project to test this roadmap, whether this roadmap is feasible to implement or to scale uh, nationally. So I've been testing this uh, roadmap some of the key strategies of the roadmap, not the whole strategies, but most of the key roadmap strategies uh, for this feasibility for the national scale. So I've been implementing in uh, 14 districts in both the agrarian and pastoral contexts, involving like uh, 66 uh, primary uh, care facilities, health centers, and uh, 273 health centers, and also private clinics. Uh, uh, and, and among us, this, uh, uh, we supported the categorization of this uh, health station program into compressive, basic, and also integrated or merged. So out of this, uh, we, uh, in this uh, uh, districts, in these 14 districts, we try to support the establishment or the uh, upgrading of health posters into compressive ones in 14 of the districts. So we, we supported uh, upgrading into uh, 15 health posters to be upgraded into compressive health posters, at least one in each uh, district to provide basic uh, uh, and compressive uh, uh, the hips service. And the other is also those who are uh, in the catchment, in the near, near to the catchment uh, of the health center and hospital that would be merged or integrated into health center and hospital. Uh, out of this, about 51 were merged into the health center, and the health service workers were also relocated into the health center or the, the primary hospital. So we have been uh, testing uh, uh, in these three areas to ensure whether this equitable access. This process of engaging the communities or also merging this uh, health process into compressive uh, or, or upgrading into compressive or merging into the health center and, and, and hospital uh, really brings an equitable access to and utilization of uh, essential RMH services, whether this could also bring quality of essential services or also improving the accountability uh, of uh, this uh, primary care uh, service to the community. So our tour of change uh, was uh, this. Uh, so to test the feasibility of this roadmap, we have been uh, uh, developing these multiple strategies, uh, one of which is also, as, uh, as I explained earlier, uh, implementing this uh, categorization of their post uh, is one of the strategies. We have been supporting uh, these intervention districts 
and also uh, facilitating the implementation of uh, or establishment of community health units into, uh, into the health center and hospital to provide uh, community health services or to strengthen, to strengthen the community health services as it's being implemented uh, at uh, health center and hospital level. The other strategies are also uh, listed here, uh, like establishing new community health cadres, uh, and etc. were also some of uh, the strategies. Uh, there are also strategies to uh, impl to implement or to uh, enhance the accountability of the primary care system into the community as well as uh, the primary uh, facilities. Uh, and also, uh, there are also some other strategies uh, we, we have been implementing to improve the quality of the education program, uh, the services that is delivered by the education program. So I will be uh, presenting our experiences in establishing the community health program unit and also uh, our experiences in merging uh, these health posters. Uh, so uh, to do this, uh, we did a rapid assessment in the, uh, last September 2023 uh, to see whether this process of merging uh, this health process into the catchment health center and uh, primary hospital is, is, is really uh, taking the right process uh, or that's the recommended process, whether that is participatory or not. And also uh, we explore the community's uh, perception and the acceptance, including the health workers' acceptance and, and, and also uh, experiences during this merging process and also identify the implementation challenges uh, during this uh, merging as well as establishing the community health unit. Uh, so for this we did a rapid uh, qualitative study, study design, which is uh, nowadays this rapid qualitative uh, uh, design is being, uh, being popular in, in, in the era of implementation science research because the traditional uh, qualitative studies, study designs took uh, long, longer time uh, to produce uh, the necessary evidence for, 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 for uh, decision making. But this type of rapid qualitative study design, is, uh, it, is, uh, it, 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 it takes short time to produce. Uh, so it is an intensive and multidisciplinary uh, type of uh, study design. Uh, which is more of a uh, programmatic uh, quality study de design approach. Uh, so we employed this uh, uh, and, and also uh, a team of, we established a team of researchers and we went in the field uh, with a predefined actu actu actually and, uh, relatively uh, semi-structured tool and also uh, uh, a predefined co 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 teams or co co of uh, or constructors that we went to uh, get from the field. Uh, and also, we also do, do document our field experiences using our... Uh, sorry. Uh, we also use our monitoring uh, uh, information uh, to uh, supplement our qualitative information. Uh, so we did uh, in total 34 interviews and four uh, FEGDs among us health workers, community, uh, uh, community representatives and also uh, program managers at the district level. So we found out this uh, themes. One is the process of merging, whether this process of merging is really participatory, uh, how that, 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 that process really went. Uh, went, uh, we, we analyzed that, uh, and also uh, found out uh, th th there are also uh, activities, major activities that under, under, undertook in each district uh, for this uh, processing, for this merging exercise. The other is uh, the establishment of uh, and functionality of the community health program unit that is expected to be established at health center and primary hospitals uh, to strengthen the basically the community health program at, at an institutional level. In addition to strengthen the facility-based education as well. Uh, the other is the community's perception and acceptance of merging, the perceived effect of uh, this merging process and establishment of uh, this community health program unit in the health center and hospital level and all ongoing challenges uh, during implementation. Uh, so I will briefly uh, discuss 
is uh, on two uh, on two major major themes. That is uh, in the establishment of community health program uh, at, at health center and uh, primary hospital. We found out that uh, this during this establishment of this community health program unit, uh, in each uh, in, in each intervention uh, facilities, health centers and hospitals, we try to establish this uh, community health program unit. We provided uh, a guideline uh, how to establish this and uh, and and what 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 would be their role uh, in implementing this community health program unit in the health center and and, and uh, uh, hospital uh, uh, compound as, as well as their catchment uh, population as well because their, uh, their catchment health post the nearby health post is merged as uh, there are communities. Uh, in, in their uh, near, near by they have to provide community programs for this uh, community. Uh, so we, we provide this, 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 this guideline. This shows the functionality over time. It, it shows uh, improvement in uh, uh, the functionality of the, the, the score uh, for this. We, 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 we measure this functionality using uh, different criteria. From the qualitative study, we found out that this uh, multiplicity uh, team, they established a multiplicity uh, team uh, to work in the outreach level as well as to coordinate fast level uh, health education programs uh, that ma that multi different previously it, it was only the extension workers that expected to go out in the field to and provide outreach services to the community but now they started they established a multiple uh, disciplinary team that uh, comprises nurses midwives and, uh, and and also health, health workers uh, uh, to provide services at out outreach level. And this team is now uh, also coordinating uh, the fast based education as well. The previous, uh, previously, as you know, the fast based education is, uh, is, is not uh, really prioritized. And also, uh, so now uh, this, uh, this establishment of this community health program unit is now also strengthening the fast based education. Now uh, they make it a priority for the facility. Uh, uh, to routinely uh, conduct a fast uh, based education for the committee as well. The other is also this uh, establishment of this committee and program unit also strengthening the committee health programs. Uh, uh, it was only as LZX workers that have been implementing this committee health program previously. Now, in, in teams, they have been providing these uh, services. And now, this committee health program unit also, uh, unit, they have been also providing. Uh, technical support to, to the catchment health post as well. Uh, in, in, in a typical uh, district or in a typical health center catchment, uh, you can expect like five uh, health posts will be there. If one is merged, they will be have at least uh, five or four or five uh, health posts in their catchment. So now they are now providing uh, technical support and managerial support as well uh, to these health posts. So in that, they have been strengthening the community health program uh, that has been undertaken in, the, in, in their uh, catchment area, uh, which includes the outreach activities or the community dialogue uh, sessions or the pregnant women conferences, etc. Et All uh, activities that have been expect, uh, expected by the research program is, is now supported by this unit. The other is uh, linkage with uh, the nearby health post and health health workers now strengthened their uh, collaboration, their linkage. In terms of referral, in terms of uh, providing technical and managerial support has been, uh, has been also significantly improved after the establishment of this uh, 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 community health program unit. Uh, there are still ch ch challenges in implementing this, like shortages of human resource, facility infrastructure, and etc. for this community uh, unit uh, to be well functional. Uh, uh, so these are some of the challenges that we, we have observed. The other team is uh, while merging, what, what lessons we draw from this merging process uh, of uh, health posts into the catchment health center or hospital. Uh, we have learned that this merging process was uh, uh, very consultative and participatory. They engaged the community uh, leaders and, uh, and also the program managers at district and health center level during the merging process. So it, it was participatory uh, and, and, and uh, the merging was, was also well accepted by the community and the health workers as well. Uh, 
so as a result this in the merged health posters health insurers are located into the health center catchment uh, or in the health center compound or primary hospital compound and their skills has been and the motivation of the health center resources has been also improved then they, they confirmed to us that during the, our interview uh, during because of the, their relocation to the health center or primary hospital compound their uh, capacity or skill in terms of providing some of the basic services like implants and insertion and, 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 and other type of skills has been uh, improved uh, uh, due to the, due to the, because of their uh, peer to peer learning and also mentor, mentoring activities they got from the health center staff. And their motivation also has been uh, improved because they, they saw this opportunity as a promotion for them to be relocated into a, in their center compound. Health centers were really motivated to further work uh, in the health center compound. Uh, the other is improved performance and efficiency of the primary care unit uh, because in some uh, uh, health centers they have been telling us that they, they have a shortage of human resource. The addition of health center workers into the health center also one. Uh, advantage to search their uh, human resource capacity and also provide uh, routine services at centers and level. Uh, it is uh, now it's the, the direction is health center workers while relocating when relocated into health center they have been working two days per week at health center at static level they have been providing the services family planning services and, and, and etc including antenatal and and then this care uh, for the rest three days they will be providing outreach services to the community. So during this uh, the days of work at the health center, they have been reducing the burden of uh, the health center's staff and also provide, contributing to the performance and efficiency of the primary care uh, system. Uh, the challenges in some uh, pastoral communities, uh, the, 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 they, they were resistant or they did not really accept, accepting this merging process. Uh, one thing is uh, in the pastoral, as you can imagine, the, this, the, the population is uh, dispersely uh, 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 located. So this uh, health posters, uh, when merged, it may not be appropriate uh, for them to access health centers. Like, uh, so we said, uh, so we said, 30 minutes walking distance. If it is less than 30 minutes walking distance, it should be merged. Sometimes they may merge. Uh, beyond 30 minutes walking distance and uh, when the that health post was merged, the health center will be uh, inaccessible to the, the community as well. So, uh, and due to that, uh, there have been uh, uh, a, a, bit of, a bit of resistance in uh, accepting this merging process. And there are also reports of dropouts of immunization due to this merging because it, it becomes far to, the health center becomes far uh, to the community where is also one challenge. But we have tried to uh, triangulate this using the routine HMI, HMIS report, but uh, due to the data quality uh, issues, we couldn't really uh, uh, figure it out whether that is really uh, true or not. But we are really implementing that. Uh, we are uh, trying to uh, uh, augment that through our implementation. We are finishing. Okay, I am finished. Okay. So the other, there are also some ch challenges for doing merging process. Uh, so in, in conclusion, it was, uh, the, this merging process was participatory and, and, and accepted in, in most communities, but still there are some communities uh, which, which didn't accept this merging process. So contextualization of this merging process, contextualization of this uh, criteria for merging is also uh, uh, one recommendation, this merging process and particularly the establishment of this community health program unit really strengthened the community health program unit and the, 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 the network between the workers and, and, and etc. Uh, so continuous advocacy with uh, com and community engagement uh, or stakeholder engagement would be very critical and contextual type of information would be. Uh, th thank you so much. I think these are my, my questions. Thank you, Dr. Zarcho. I think the time is nine. So uh, he present nicely. So uh, I think just three more suggestions, feedback, or any ask. Thank you, Dr. Zarcho, for presenting uh, how to optimize I think, uh, the health extension program in Ethiopia based on the experience that we have had before. 
but um, uh, it would be very good if we, you, you, you can, maybe you could uh, reflect on uh, your thesis, what is the thesis of uh, your, your, your paper, what's the argument, uh, uh, is, is, is the margin and uh, it's also good if you reflect what you mean by margin. Is that administrative margin or uh, bringing together the service outlet that we give at health post center, at health, uh, at, uh, at health center level, or uh, it, is, it, is, it is pretty not pretty much clear for me. Uh, the other is uh, uh, you, you have uh, you have you have shown us some figure regarding the functionality of the service outlet facilities. How do you score that one? Because uh, I think the, 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 the methodology of the data collection the tool you used is uh, focus group discussion and in-depth interview. Will this help you to really show the functionality of uh, the facilities? Thank you. Yeah, uh, thanks. Uh, thank you for the interesting presentation. Just one thought on picking up on your last point. Apologies, I was not there for the entire presentation, but you mentioned that uh, health extension workers often go alone for outreach to the communities, right? Yeah. So have you also, you know, thought about or you put it in your thesis now, I think you know that you're doing a thesis, on involvement of other stakeholders. For example, there's a lot of youths, adolescents in the communities, right? They might not be able to do vaccination or speak about uh, speak about more technical terms, but I'm sure they can help in the outreach with limited uh, limited capacity or kind of orientation. Are there any examples you've tried it out, experimented, or something to consider for the future? Thank you. For the sake of time, two or three hundred. Thank you, Dr. Zacho, for the ICD presentation on uh, the Execution uh, Optimization Program. My uh, question is, uh, the idea of the Execution Program, or the health post construction, was to bring the service more closer to the community, and the community to access the uh, service every possible time, when they, when they need it, right? And uh, now, when we merged it, we are now pulling the health post into the health center, is, a little bit making a distance to the community. And the other thing, when the health post was constructed, it was by the community where the community is owned it, and then now that also functionality get used. And, uh, and also when they do the health, uh, I mean, when they do the outreach like three times a week, there are issues like uh, the travel issues, the transportation issue, and the like. And the very interesting part is. It, it is not the integrated way of like the family head team, okay? It's not a team going different, the each spirit team is not going to visit the health, the, the home of the first, the, 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 the individual, so that they, they would have get comprehensive. But the previous service was, you know, in a very minimal way. Previously, in the health sports, they were getting a lot of service. But now, every, I mean, three times a week, by outreach. And how did you see it that? Thank you very much. So when we merge it, uh, accessibility and utilization of health care uh, services under question. So how do you see or address this issue in your study? Uh, the second question is related to the outreach program. Uh, as you said in Asir Learning, there is a multidisciplinary team uh, who works as the outreach service. So how do you, in your study, how do you see the effectiveness and quality of the service. 
each witness. Thank you very much. Uh, this is the title from uh, USA Health Behavior Activity. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sancho, uh, for your request uh, uh, presentation, which is uh, very impressive and insightful. Uh, yeah, uh, we know uh, the meditation program is a program introduced in Ethiopia to, uh, to access the community with uh, the preventive strategy of health service. Uh, so, uh, having this in mind, uh, I think uh, the previous extension program uh, strategies has been uh, implemented starting from some years back. And this is, uh, this roadmap is uh, the revitalization on how to strengthen uh, the program on the ground. So, uh, to be uh, the roadmap, the optimization roadmap has been started, I think, from four or three years back. And uh, uh, how could uh, you suggest the impact so far, the impact uh, recorded in implementing uh, the roadmap or the optimization roadmap so far? And again, also, uh, uh, what were the success stories being uh, obtained during the course of implementation of the health extension program optimization roadmap? And what uh, the major uh, challenges? You try to mention uh, some challenges. Uh, are they enough? Because uh, I may see uh, some uh, additional challenges that in the beat this uh, program uh, to be uh, successfully implemented, like commitment. Was one of the challenges or uh, there was no any commitment problem at all level? Uh, this is another issue. And the last one is, uh, I think communication demand all aspect of demand generation activities. In this regard, uh, IPC or counseling service are very crucial in health facilities. So uh, I couldn't see anything uh, being presented reflecting how the health care professionals were doing to provide uh, counseling service in order to advance social and uh, communication activities. Uh, Thank you. I think, uh, after reflection, we have uh, waiting your Fine. lunch time here. We can continue to discuss. <laughs> Thank you so much uh, for the comments and uh, uh, questions as well. Uh, so uh, the first one is uh, what were the arguments as uh, described earlier. The the, this is uh, the first project actually after the roadmap uh, and then also the flash pro, uh, program I, I can say after the roadmap uh, is launched in Ethiopia. So uh, the main hypothesis is, uh, is actually is it feasible, this roadmap, is it feasible to implement or to scale nationally? That is how uh, and what, what, uh, what would be the critical strategies? Uh, that, that would drive this roadmap to, in, in, into the field. So th that's the major issues uh, or the major uh, hypothesis. So uh, taking RMSH as an example, we're uh, testing this hypothesis whether this, opt uh, this roadmap or this optimization of this roadmap uh, would be feasible to, uh, for, for national scale. Uh, so we are taking our message as an example, and we, we took different strategies as, as, as uh, uh, listed there. That's also context dependent in pastoral and agrarian as well. Uh, so in three areas, quality of our message, access to RMC services, and also accountability uh, uh, of the primary scale facilities to the community, as well as uh, the health workers, the managers, uh, particularly from the, to, to, the, to, to their 
uh, support support letters. So we have been uh, 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 seeing this into, into that hypothesis. Particular for these two strategies, I am presenting two these strategies out of uh, more than ten strategies. These two strategies is really merging these health posters, really accepted by the community or the health worker. It's one. And, and, and uh, is it really uh, the process, was the process of merging really participatory? It, it may be related to the ownership, it may be related to the distance. Some communities are not really accepting that merging process. So it needs contextualization. While in the, we, we said like 30 minutes working distance, uh, if it is the health post is located 30 minutes working distance from the Cashman Health Center or primary hospital, it should be merged. Or if the health post is located under the health center or primary hospital catchment, it should be merged. Uh, compound, I mean. If it is a health center or primary hospital compound, it should be merged. Is one. It's, it's, it's actually, this is. Uh, uh, we can say this, this would be an efficient way of uh, optimizing the health issue program. Uh, but this 30 minutes uh, watching this distance may be associated with ownership of uh, the community or with, uh, because the communities are well, well connected with the health workers, it is easy for them to get services from health workers rather than health center staff. Uh, due to that, they may, they may not accept that, so it, it may it needs, uh, close consultation of, with uh, the community while merging, and also it may need like uh, different criteria of merging uh, this, this health process. This is one uh, critical learning that we have, uh, and it will be also uh, an important lesson for the ministry as well, while scaling up this uh, uh, HIP roadmap implementation. Uh, in, in terms of uh, access, I, I think I, I try to answer in, in this way. Uh, uh, the hypothesis is, is, is actually since uh, these health spots are uh, near or it is in the compound of the health center and uh, uh, the, the primary hospital, it would be a duplicate of activities because these health centers and primary hospitals are also providing primary uh, care uh, to the community. They can uh, 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 provide this community health, health service or HIP services to the community. Uh, so in, in, in this way, you can uh, uh, produce uh, uh, an efficient system, that is the hypothesis. Uh, and in, in, in some communities, uh, as, as described earlier, uh, not only access, uh, it may not be accepted uh, by the community with different reasons. Not only access, but with other reasons, may not ac may be accepted. But in terms of access, it, it, definitely, definitely, it will not, it will not be a uh, major change. For the major change, it's a comprehensive response that would bring major uh, change in terms of access. Because we are uh, expanding uh, comprehensive health services to the community. Those uh, health posters far from the catchment health center would be upgraded into comprehensive ones to provide comprehensive health posters. And you will be staffed with uh, midwives, health centers, uh, midwives, uh, health officers, and nurses. And they are providing uh, now uh, delivery services and outpatient uh, services, which, which were not part of uh, the previous uh, HIP service. So th th that's actually the major access uh, point. And the community engagement is also another uh, access point that engaging other, other community uh, groups like the youth, the men, and also the, the, there are. Uh, Village health leaders, newly established community health workers, well, uh, better educators than the previous community uh, engagement strategies, and, 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 and also their gender mix. Uh, and they are now closely work with uh, health health workers, and, and they, are, they are taking messages from health health, from health, 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 health workers, and also delivering into uh, the community. They are also identifying pregnant women. Uh, they are identifying births happening in the community, and also link uh, into their system. So this is how they have been improving access. Uh, so in terms of outreach, I think this, uh, in addition to health workers located from health center, uh, uh, this community volunteers are also working with, uh, with health center workers during the outreach uh, uh, services. But while we, uh, we have been saying multidisciplinary team uh, in, in terms of like in terms of uh, a skill mix. Uh, uh, to provide uh, quality services to the community. Uh, if, if, if this multiple team composed, composed of health workers, midwives, nurses, or, or 
uh, laboratory technicians and etc they can provide uh, uh, a comprehensive and also uh, tailored uh, counseling or replication to the community that's uh, why we say multiple is to mean that but often still uh, still after the establishment of this committee health program unit uh, still, often health workers are, are working alone or going alone to the, the, the field or the, the, the community and providing services. Uh, th there are <coughs> reasons mentioned by these uh, uh, health workers. Uh, the workload uh, often complained, but uh, uh, the efficiency studies also show here. Primary health centers, particular health centers are not really efficient. They are not really. Uh, providing an ad ad adequate number of uh, cases per day. Uh, so, so, but the, the, they often complain by the workload and other incentives and motiv motivational mechanisms are also uh, raised. Uh, I think the other is, uh, in terms of uh, like scoring the functionality of the community health program unit, as present is this, the qualitative uh, findings as well as our project monitoring findings as well. So for our program monitoring purpose, we developed a, a 